have a bunch of candy, 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 candy on my front uh, row here with me, and uh, we need some of that candy. If you can thank your member today, good news, you've got one more week. You can bring it next uh, Sunday. We're going to have our fall festival on Sunday afternoon, and uh, it's a big deal to have a good, nice, clean place for families to come in our uh, neighborhood and our area. So uh, it'll all be going on next Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, is uh, when we'll be doing that. So we need some candy. Don't forget. And if I don't remind you, uh, at the end of the service, somebody remind me. Amy's gone to visit her mom uh, today, so uh, she hadn't got wise and left me. She's coming back, I hope, this week. Uh, but uh, she's gone, so she can't remind me of all the things she reminds me of. You know what happened today? This happened to me every day of my ministry. I come to church. I got everything in my bag that I need for the Lord's Day. And I always look at my bag when I get here and go, oh, I forgot something. I call Amy to get it. Well, today I called and she was in Tennessee, so I had to go home and get my Bible that I left at home today. Kind of important to have your Bible. Take your Bible and look to Ezekiel chapter 38 uh, with me today. We're going to dive into a passage. I've got all kinds of information uh, today to uh, bring before us. I hope that uh, I can get through all of this today and make some sense out of it. I am not by nature an end-time prophecy preacher in the sense that I do not, um, I, I'm just not drawn to a lot of prophetic uh, passages. I've got some friends that are really into that and really good at it and really know a lot of what the Bible teaches about it. I like reading about it. I've certainly preached through the years on it, but I felt led to do a little series here in between uh, our time coming out of our dedication and going into uh, uh, Christmas uh, soon, and I thought I'm going to put something together on on end time prophecy because there's so many things going on in the world today and I told my friend Bobby Atkins bishop in Atlanta I said uh, you know I really don't want to do this end time series because really I don't want to study that much you know I'm gonna have to study a whole lot to get all this right and uh, so anyway I went ahead and dove in we've already looked at a couple of messages in it today we're gonna go deep into Ezekiel chapter 38 today now, one of the reasons that I've not always been so much into prophecy is, that, you know, prophecy, by its very nature, is speculative and sometimes. We get things right, and sometimes we think something fits, and then a little time passes and we realize it doesn't fit. Uh, when we had our recent, um, you know, flood in this building with the pipe bursting during the freeze back in February, I took the opportunity to clean out some of my library, and, uh, you know, I threw away a lot of prophecy books. Prophecy books like The World Will End with Y2K. I don't think we need that book anymore. It didn't end, you know. Uh, I had another one that was titled, uh, Osama bin Laden is the Antichrist. Toss that baby, you know, because uh, if he's the Antichrist, he's going to have to be resurrected because he's dead, you know. And uh, so a lot of times we get things wrong, especially the sensational nature of it. The other reason is that when you go to uh, prophecy, especially the one message I was preaching today, when you start talking about nations and people and what's going on in the world and all that, you, you can't help but be political a little bit and name that. You know, if you're a guest or if you haven't uh, been with us, I'll make it very clear to you, I know very much I am not under any illusion. The United States of America, which is the greatest nation in the world, it is not the kingdom of God. I know the difference, okay? But that doesn't mean you can't be patriotic. That doesn't mean you can't understand some things about uh, our world today and uh, where we might be in it. So I'm going to dive into this in Ezekiel 38. I want to talk about today a question that I would have never announced this last week if I knew how much I was going to have to study. But I told you last week I'm going to preach on what role does America, what role does the United States of America play in biblical prophecy? Is the United States in the Bible? And I'm going to try to answer that uh, pretty simply, I hope, as we get into this passage. Ezekiel chapter 38. I'm going to go ahead and read to you several verses today. These are very difficult verses. They're only understood in the context of, of really an uh, understanding of knowing that, um, that where the nations fit today. Understand, and I'll get into this as we get into the message, but understand today that, that the nations are not mentioned as they are today. Lines get drawn and redrawn. Geography stays the same. And uh, so you're going to hear a lot of names you're not going to recognize in here. I'm going to try to put them into position and place for you as we get into it. Beginning in verse 1, Ezekiel 38. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, 
set your face against Gog in the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma, that's one I want to settle on a little bit. The house, it's not just a nation listed or a people listed, it says the house of Togarma. From the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you'll be visited. Now look at this, what this prophecy is for. In the latter years. This prophecy that Ezekiel is speaking of. In the latter years you will come into the land, those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, that they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass. That thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against, he's talking about going up against Israel here, going up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder, to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba, and this is a key verse. Look at this verse with me. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to plunder, to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy. Say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. Here it is again. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. And it goes on in the prophecy to say that in this great battle of coming against Israel, there will be an intervention supernaturally by God. Israel won't even have to fight. That happened in their history several times. This one will be one as well where God himself takes care of it. And in doing so, his people are going to experience a great spiritual revival of, of, of knowledge and worship and uh, walking with him. And the whole, all the nations of the earth will, be, will glorify God for what great things that he has done. So let's dive into this if we can learn something. The Bible is a book of predictive prophecy. Uh, just about every page you find some story of something that's about to happen or is going to happen in the future. We find events that are foretold of that actually come true even as the prophet or the one mentions it in scripture. We find many, many prophecies about a coming Messiah in the Old Testament. And Jesus fulfilled those, uh, those many prophecies in his first coming. And there are many others he'll, pr- he'll fulfill in his second coming into the earth. The New Testament comes. Jesus himself gave predictive prophecy. He said, I'm going to return for you. Paul elaborated that in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he said one day he will come from heaven with a shout, with a voice, and with the archangel and the trump of God. He's going to come and the the bride of Christ, those of us, will be gathered into his presence. So we know these truths are there, but it also speaks throughout about how this world will end up. That is what we call end time prophecy. Now the question that is before us today is, Is America somewhere in the Bible in these prophecies about the end time? You know, that may be a selfish question right off the bat because we want to say, why wouldn't we ask, is Brazil in the Bible or is Mexico in the Bible or 
you know, any other country. Why do we say that? Well, because mainly we're in America, but also because of the uniqueness of this nation that you and I live within. I mean, can there be another nation that has been so different and unique? I mean, it's indisputable that this nation was founded on a Judeo-Christian ethic and from our signs and our symbols and our songs and our sayings, the very founding documents themselves are rooted in biblical language of a people who recognize that it is the God of heaven that gives us these rights. And, and, and it's so clear in that people try to rewrite history, they have a good time trying to do that, but it can't happen because it's very clear. Also, in 1948, when Israel did what nobody ever thought was possible but reclaimed their land and declared themselves a nation, it was President Harry S. Truman who immediately and first among all the nations of the world agreed to recognize Israel. And America has been a very strong ally of this democracy in the Middle East throughout these 73 years plus of history that they have enjoyed. So it's a pretty fair question to ask, why in the world can we not find America somewhere in the Bible? Now we'll give you a couple of little foundation things here. One, nations are generally only mentioned in the Bible in relationship to God's people Israel. Uh, you know, so that there's a big nation of China, there's a big nation here that's had a, a long history of that. Where if it doesn't concern what God is doing with his people, very rarely is a nation mentioned. Where we find that is many times the nations of the earth. All the nations will stand before him. All the peoples of the earth will stand before him. So we see that as well. Also, it's important to point out, as I said just a minute ago, that the names that the Bible would use when someone gives a prophecy is of a region or a people or even a nation of that day. Now, you and I know that over time, lines get drawn differently. But the regions and people groups stay the same throughout all of, uh, all of time. So we have to always recognize when we see these names, we've got to go back and look at our maps and say, where were these people located? And God loves to go back to the very beginning, Genesis gives us the table of nations. We covered that many years ago when we studied about the days of Noah and we learned that God himself showed how the descendants of uh, Noah filled the earth and all of the nations of the earth can be represented in their, um, uh, their uh, coming to us. My phone just rang. I forgot to turn my iPad off. Excuse me. You know, who calls me? I'm kind of busy at 11.30 on Sunday morning. I mean, I mean, who calls the preacher at 11.30? I usually put do not disturb on it. I didn't do it. I called attention to it. They're calling. If I get another call, I'll silence it. So anyway, that's what's happening. So get back to our thing here. So the names and regions are used. And uh, those names and regions are what we have to go back and look at and see where they fit. Now, where's America? Now, prophecy teachers have, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, but there's been several verses that prophecy teachers have tried to go to and find America in, most of them pretty spurious and pretty much full of conjecture. Uh, Revelation 13, 11 says there was another beast. Beasts were always nations in the apocalyptic imagery of Revelation. And so another beast came up, but this one different than all the others. The others were rose out of the sea. That means the Mediterranean Sea where all of the nations of, of the earth in that time were connected to the great nations. But said this one came out of the earth, and some people try to say that's America. Isaiah 18 in verse 2 speaks of a people, a nation of tall and smooth of skin, a people who are powerful from the beginning, whose land the rivers divide. Some have gone to that verse, and it seems very interesting, but it usually doesn't hold up. Uh, to be that without just reading a lot into it. Revelation 12:14 12, says the woman there was given the wings of a great eagle. What is the symbol of America but an eagle? And some run to that and say, well, this is us in the role of helping and doing that. Again, you have to read, uh, you have to kind of make it fit uh, to see that. Others have said we're Babylon the Great and we're part of that revived Roman Empire, assimilated into that in the end times. All of those have been given and by some people and and really, we don't, we don't find a lot of evidence there. Some of it is fascinating, but it doesn't really stand true. But there's one that really gets a lot of people's attention. And that's the one that I've read to you in Ezekiel 38. Now, hang with me here for a moment. And I'm going to try to talk to you just a little bit about what untangle all these nations that are mentioned here so that we can kind of understand what's given. Now, 
a lot of people will come to the Bible and say, oh, Ezekiel was just talking about when they came back to the land. There's one really big problem with that. Twice he says latter days. But even more importantly, the next chapter, chapter 39, God promises his people that they will then build a temple that will never be destroyed, of which he himself will take residence in, and his presence will be there forever. Well, I have news for you. Ezekiel prophesied during the exile of God's people, and they indeed came back to the land, and they did indeed build a temple, but in 70 A.D., the Roman Empire destroyed that temple. And God would not be true to his word if it was that temple that he was talking about. Because God said, I'll be with you forever. And so there has to be a future indication to all of this prophecy that is here. So he talks about this war. Many people refer to this war by the first ones that are mentioned, Gog and Magog. That's two strange names. And where does that fit? Let me just say this real quickly. That in order for this battle to take place, if you take what happened in chapter 36 and 37, all the verses around it, then you have to see that God's people have to be in a certain, or, or the, the nation, his chosen nation, has to be in a certain position. People are returning to the land in great numbers like never before. Today, people, as I told you a couple of weeks ago, are making Aliyah. They are returning to the land from Russia, from the United States, from all the nations of the world, Jews returning to make Israel their home in ways that has never been done before in the history of the earth. There is a must be, in order for this prophecy to be fulfilled, a massive rebuilding of the cities. That has happened in 70 years of their history. In these recent times, they have built cities and and furnished cities that have been destroyed. People will build an army. Only time Israel had an army, anything like they have today, is since they've been back in the land. And so that is a precursor to this taking place. It has to come at a season of rest when God's people are living in security. We don't really see that yet. There are walls built over there. There are people trying to kill them and destroy them. And, and there's a lot of security. When I, we go to Israel, I took 50 folks there just a couple of years ago, many of you, and we went there, you learn what it's like to go through a real airport when you go to Tel Aviv. They don't mess around, they're not politically correct, and they have really hard questions to ask you before you get on the plane and uh, fly out of there or when you come into their land as well. And they're in unparalleled prosperity, it says as well. So all that's a precursor. Then we come to Gog and Magog. Well, who are all of these people here? How do they fit? If you go back to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2, hang with me now. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2, it is giving the table of the nations. You remember Noah was the one that was saved through the flood. There were those that were destroyed in the flood. There were those that were saved through the flood. And there were those that were taken out before the flood, Enoch. We looked at him last week. And so here is Noah and his family. So when they come off of the ark, they have to repopulate the nations of the earth. And so Genesis 10 tells us about this. And it says, one of his sons was Japheth. Now listen to this, Genesis 10 too. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. It's going to tell us his grandson is Togorma. So these very names that are mentioned here go back to the very beginning of the names of which God called the nation. So now let's ask, where are they located? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I brought a map with me today. If it'll show up up there, if you can see this. I know it's a little hard in the distance and all. But you see Israel right in the middle there of that land of uh, really where Africa and Asia come together. And uh, Israel's in that strategic piece of land. Look where these people are located. It mentions Ethiopia and Cush. They're located in the southern, what we would think of as southern Egypt area. Cush was an ancient empire of peoples that actually stretched over in the Arabian Peninsula. Put is actually the Hebrew word used for the nation of Libya, but everyone knows that stands for Libya, so we translate in our English as Libya. That's actually coming from the west into them. Of course, Egypt as well, uh, right there immediately to the west of Israel. And then when you go north, you see the Persian Empire, which is modern-day Iran. Persian Empire was one of the greatest empires on the face of the earth, and it was huge. Today it's much smaller, but it's represented in that place in Iran. Then you go north of that area, and you come into the area. I've got a little thing here that I don't know if you can see it all there, but that's Gog and Magog area, which today 
is uh, mainly a part of Russia, uh, some of the states that broke off from the Soviet Union, Georgia, Kazakhstan, whatever is over here, all those stands that are around that area. But that's the region that it's from. Russia still comes down uh, to the, the, uh, the sea there. But all of those are represented in Gog and Magog. And then Gomer gets over here into this region of Eastern Europe uh, as, as well. Now, the one I'll call your attention to is in the middle there, Togorma. Togorma is basically an area of people where modern-day Turkey is. Now, I want to talk to you about that just for a moment, to Turkey. And I got, I got another map that shows these regions a little bit better, if you can see it. You can kind of see up here the, the different ones I mentioned. Some of that's drawn a little, little broad, but you see Kush down here, Put, which is Libya, you know, Persia, which is Iran, uh, Magog and Gog and all this, and uh, you know, all these areas up here. And they're coming down from the north, but Togorma is the house of Togorma that's right there. Now, you've got to know a little something about this region of Togorma to know how important this is. Follow me with this. Don't let me bore you, but get this down. This is a little bit of what's going on in the world today that represents some of these areas today. It's really amazing what's happening in all these nations today in the world that we live in. Now, Turkey is the one I call your attention to, and if I say anything else to you today to say, an end-time prophecy, listen to me, in the world you and I live in today, keep your eyes on Turkey. Keep your eyes on the house of Togorma. Let me tell you the history of that area. That area of Togorma is the area of Asia Minor. It's the area where the church flourished for the first 1,500 years. The seven churches of Asia Minor that Jesus wrote to in Revelation 2 and 3 are located in that area. That is the area where all the councils of the church came together and assembled to settle the issues about our Bible and about the person of Jesus and all of those things. That area is the ancient area where the whole issue with Noah took place and the ark and when it came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. And so we have so much history that took place with the church there. Constantinople was founded there and that became the headquarters of the Eastern Roman Empire in a, in a place where the uh, Constantine and others would call people to and, and the great Hagia Sophia church would be built there and, and it, it was a, a wonderful flourishing place for Christianity until a certain time when the Turks started coming in and when some very strong militant Muslim people started taking over and warring against them until ultimately they took over the whole region. That would then be called the Ottoman Empire. And it would rule for 600 years, all the way up to World War I, when they were finally, the last one was defeated. At that time, Turkey came together and became a, a, a very secular type nation, like our nation, any nation that, that gathers not favoring one religion over another. And they became an important ally to the West in that region for many, many years there. And uh, they were very moderate, They're mostly Muslim people, but very open to the things of... Uh, uh, of, uh, of the freedom of religion and all of those things. Well, along comes a guy that runs for office that is now currently in charge there named Erdogan. Erdogan is said real funny, and I know I'm not sounding it, saying it exactly right. But he comes along and he runs as a moderate to win the election, and he wins the election. The minute he wins the election, his true colors start coming out. He's no moderate. He is a radical Islamicist. He is one that's determined to shut all the churches down. He shut down the Hagia Sophia, which had become kind of a museum for both, and now it's not anything to do with the church anymore. He began to drive Christians out of the country, and he really started angering because Turkey had become a member of NATO. Turkey had been accepted among the nations, and now they're moving in a different direction completely. Some of you may remember that there was a pastor there by the name of Andrew Brunson, who had been there for years as a pastor of a Presbyterian church in Turkey. And all at once, Erdogan picked him up and put him in jail and said, uh, you're tied to radical people, which was so not true. He is not political. He was just a pastor in that area. He spent two years in a Turkish prison. And during that two years, we were, people were doing everything to try to get him free. Finally, it gets to the administration that comes to power in Washington, and Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, starts lobbying Erdogan and the other people in that country. You need to let this guy go. He doesn't belong in jail. He said, no, I want, I want to show the world that I'm more powerful than the United States. And I want to show them that these Christians, I want, to, I want all the other missionaries to know I can do what I did to him at any time. 
That's what he said when he got out of prison. Finally, it came to Donald Trump. Donald Trump said, uh, in a personal conversation with Erdogan, you need to let this guy go. Erdogan said, no. You don't tell Donald Trump no, amen? I mean, we can agree on a lot of things about Donald Trump, but one thing, he don't take no very easily, you know? And you know what he did? He turned around and slapped them with all kinds of economic sanctions. Woo, brought them to their knees. They already had a shaky economy. Now it was about to fall completely apart. And Erdogan gave up and released Andrew Brunson. He came back to the United States. He's written a book about his time there as well. Let me tell you what happened now. He's elected. It's a democratic country. Erdogan's elected. But what happens? A group of generals came against him back in 2016. And they decided they were going to, uh, you know, do a coup because he was getting too much power. And he put the coup down and in doing so took all of the power from them and everyone and declared himself now in charge, dismissed parliament. A lot of people believe, and I'm one of them, that he set up that whole coup on purpose. You know, it was all designed so that he would have an excuse to grab the power. Now he's continually putting himself into a dictator position and bringing that radical Islamic ideas with him and becoming great friends with Russia in the process of doing these things. Keep your eye on him. The house of Togorma, that's Turkey, will be very central to that last battle, joining with Gog and Magog, which are the forces today we know as a Russian nation, which again went through upheaval. You know, for years people thought there's no way Russia could be in that prophecy because Russia is a Christian nation when they had the czars, but then the revolution of 1917, they became a communist atheist country. Then even with another revolution, we thought they were going to choose democracy, but they haven't. They've gone right back, and we see those powers there in that place. Now, can I just tell you something else real quick? I don't want to bore you with all this stuff, but look, let me tell you what's going on in the Middle East today. I mean, most of the Middle Eastern powers today want peace, like never before we are seeing that. There are only two that are sponsoring radical view of Islam, and that is Iran and increasingly Turkey. Only those two. You go to Jordan, you, you get in, in, in uh, Jordan and you see King Abdullah II, a man of peace, of moderation, who's struggling to keep his nation together against ISIS that's trying to radicalize it. In Egypt, you had the Arab uprising. And the Arab uprising that came, they kicked out a long, stable democracies that they had there, or whatever they were. And all at once, now it's chaos. And, 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 and one guy came to power and he started just allowing Christians to be persecuted. How many of you remember seeing the picture of all the men that were marched in orange jumpsuits out and were beheaded? Hundred, uh, I think dozens of them were beheaded. Christian, Coptic Christians that were beheaded. Well, there was a general named Sisi who said, I've had enough of this, I'm taking over. He took over, ran him out of power, declared the power, put everything back together, and Sisi is a peace-loving guy. He wants peace with Israel. He wants peace with the world, and he doesn't want radical Islam in his country. Matter of fact, you know what Sisi did? He, listen to this, he built a church. He's a Muslim. He built a church, the largest church in the Middle East, and gave it to the Christians on Christmas Eve because he wants to have freedom of religion and peace in his country. Same is true of Jordan's King Abdullah. Then you go to the United Arab Emirates. Both the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia have crown princes that are in charge today. One of them is known as MBZ, one of them is known as MBN, Mohammed bin Zan and Mohammed bin Naya. And those two are really running things today, and both of them are bringing incredible reforms to their country. Now, there's some issues in Saudi Arabia and, and a group of evangelicals have asked him to let them build churches. He said, if I let you build churches, that'll just become a site for the terrorists to attack right now. Can't do it right now, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to do it. But they're still, they want peace with Israel. You know, one thing that, can I just say this? I mean, excuse me, and let me put a parenthesis in here. But you know what happened at the end of the Trump administration? His son-in-law, Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, is a, is a Jewish man. And he brought together nations and worked tirelessly for years and brought these nations together and they signed this thing called the Abraham Accords a little over a year ago. They signed this. Unbelievable. 
Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates became the first Arab nations to sit down and say, we want peace with Israel, and signed it, said, we're tired of the Palestinians fighting them. They never want peace. They're never going to come to the table for anything. Yes, our Arafat turned down the deal that Bill Clinton said ruined his presidency, a deal of peace. And he said, I don't want peace. They just want to fight. And so these other nations say, I'm tired of the Palestinians all this time. We're just going to make peace with Israel anyway. And so two of them have, Morocco has now come and joined them, and others want to as soon as they can. And by the way, if you're under any illusions that the Nobel Prize for Peace is nothing but an absolute political sham, there is no reason, no matter what you think of him, no matter what you might have of any kind of ideas about him, Donald Trump did what no one else has ever done, brought Arabs to the table to sign a peace agreement with Israel to recognize their existence and to live in peace with them. And they didn't give that to him, but they gave it to Yasser Arafat. They gave it to these. It's a joke. That thing is a joke. Anybody would think that's any, anything more than that. Well, so these nations are wanting peace, but who doesn't want peace? I'll tell you who doesn't want peace. Iran doesn't want peace. Iran has a group of people in charge of it that have said they are consumed with a radical Islamic eschatology that says we've got to blow up the world. You say, oh, Pastor, they, yes, that's what they say all the time. They say there is a solution for Israel, and it's one bomb, and as soon as we get it, we're releasing it to destroy them and wipe them off the face of the earth. Now, isn't it real wise to give that kind of people $300 million in cash and $1.7 billion of the American people's money and, and tell them they can build their nuclear? That's real wise. Every leader of every peace-loving Arab state said, don't do that. And we did it anyway. And we have seen nothing as a result of them ever changing in any way to be peace. Can I share with you one other thing about This is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, you, you know, I'm going to share what, you know, this idea of House of Togorma and Turkey, and I told you all the things that happened. Do you know the third letter Jesus wrote to a church was to the church at Pergamon, Pergamos, and it was there in the heart of where Turkey is that day. And Jesus said something in that letter that's so powerful. This is the Lord speaking through his servant, uh, John, who, who wrote these letters. And here's what Jesus said, Revelation 2. To the angel church in Pergamos, write these things, say, who is a sharp head to his story? Here it is, verse 13. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Jesus said, Satan's throne is in the middle of the house of Togorma in Pergamum, known as that Greek city then. And everyone understood when he said this, this was the altar of Zeus that had been built there. And he says this, goes on further, he said, my, you hold fast to my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Twice. He said, that's where the throne of Satan is. Twice. The altar of Zeus. Antipas, by the way, was a pastor that was ordained and set there by John the Apostle himself. And Antipas refused to quit casting out demons, and he cast out so many demons that the, the people that ran the altar of Zeus and all the other pagan things were complaining and said, he's wrecking us, he's delivering everybody, everybody's getting free, demons are leaving, that's what we thrive on. So they came to him and said, we're going to put him down. You know what they did? You ought to read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometimes. They put him in a bull that was made out of a form of metal, and they put him inside of it, and it has these pipes in it and they cut a fire underneath it and literally roast him to death inside it and when he screams and moves it made it look like it was moving and alive so demonic and here Jesus said he was my faithful martyr my faithful witness who died for the faith that's where Satan's throne is well I'm about to show you something here look at these pictures that I've got here first of all this is that that's where the altar of Zeus is that's what it would look like if you went there today to Pergamon you say, well, I don't see much. It's not there. If it was there, it'd look like this. This next picture, the actual Colosseum is still there, and you could look for the Colosseum, and that's it over in the far side, but it's not there. Where is it? Well, the next picture will show you where it is. It was taken and disassembled and taken to Berlin, Germany, and reassembled. And the throne of Satan, the altar of Zeus that stood in Pergamum, now is a museum in Berlin, Germany. Very interesting. 
Because you know what happened? Albert Speer, who was the architect behind the Nazi regime, put together an unbelievable stadium for Hitler to give his massive propaganda speeches. And when he did it, he designed it based upon the altar of Zeus. They couldn't use the actual one because they needed a place that would seat 350,000 people that they would bring in. And if you looked at the details, it's all the same. Now I'm going to show you something. Don't gasp before I show you. Don't think, read too much into it when I show it to you. I debated on whether he was showing you this. But back when our 44th president ran for office, he announced that he was going to run for office in a big production. And when he did, he built it like this. <laughs> and it looks exactly like that. I don't believe President Obama was the Antichrist. Amen. There were a lot of books written on that. And guess what? Uh, he's not, and their books are on the sale table today or whatever. Uh, but I mean, isn't that crazy? I said, here's my thing. I, he's got some strange ideas about designing a, a way of announcing something, you know, to, to model it after something that looked exactly like that. So look at here. God says, the throne of Satan is in that very area, Togorma. That is where it's going to come from. That's where this army assembles and comes down. Well, Pastor, it's almost over, and you never told us about America. Well, did you see verse 13 when it says all this is happening? It says this in verse 13. Sheba, Dedans, the merchants of Tarshish and their young lions are going to say, why are you doing this? Why are you plundering? Why are you coming to do this? Now, let me, let me show you our map again real quick. I'm just going to give you something real fast on this. If you look at the map right here, there's Israel. This is the Mediterranean Sea right here. If you're on this side, that's the Mediterranean Sea right here. Right in this little area right there, it's called the Strait of Gibraltar. It's that little opening that lets you go from the Mediterranean into the Atlantic Ocean. What happened was most people thought that was the end of the world right there at the Rock of Gibraltar. That's it. As a matter of fact, there's an old uh, saying that they had uh, non plus ultra on there, which meant no more beyond. Well, after... Columbus and a few of his people sailed. They came back and took the nine out. Like, there's a lot beyond, you know, there. But at the time, they didn't think much there. So what happened was the brave sailors started going out, coming up to Spain, France, what we know as France today, and into the British Isles. And most scholars believe Tarshish represents the British Isles. They had gone so far, and they were able to get tin there, which that was the only place you could find that particular type metal. And so when they speak of Tarshish, they're speaking about an area where Great Britain is. And notice what it says, if that is true. It says, then the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lines, who came out of the British Empire? Well, I know of 13 colonies that came out of the British colony, you know, that united and threw off uh, British rule and became the United States of America. How about Australia? How about Canada? All of these would be young lines, and what appears to happen here, and follow me, I'm going to finish this up. What appears to take place here is that you have a group of nations that are against this battle, but have no power to do anything about it. My, they're saying, oh, you don't need to do that, you don't need to do that, but they're not stepping in to do anything because they don't have the power, the military power to do anything about it. That's where a lot of people feel that America's really not in, pro it, it, whether that's true or not, but that we have grown to a place of irrelevance and we're just not uh, involved anymore. That's hard to say. I'm a Christian. I believe in the kingdom of God first and foremost, but I'm also a patriotic citizen of America. How could America become to a place where it's irrelevant? Can I just number the ways that it could happen like this? I wrote down four or five here. I'll just say them quickly. What if we just finally sink under the enormous debt that we have as a nation? I mean, my goodness. We're told by our politicians, $3 trillion, we're going to do this $3 trillion or whatever it is, domestic uh, programs for all this liberal list of progressives who want to teach everybody genders and all this weird stuff and everything. $3 trillion. Oh, and it's not going to cost a dime. I wish I could operate my finances at 122 Park Lane like that. I'd go buy me the nicest car tomorrow, and I'd tell my wife it's not going to cost us a dime. She'd say, yeah, and you woke up, you know. No, that's ridiculous. We're, 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 we could easily just find that spiral in infl inflation, just go crazy, and we become a third world country just over our debt. What if we experienced a devastating terrorist attack? 
Only by the grace of God and the hedge we built around us have we been kept safe. I mean, my goodness, they could, I don't know how, they could get 12 dirty bombs into 12 major cities and wreck our nation, kill our infrastructure, take out our, our, our electricity grid with a, uh, with thing. Wasn't it weird back when we had the freeze in Texas, and Texas is such a strong state, but wasn't it weird when the power went off at your house? I almost froze to death with my family in 1993 in the blizzard of Chattanooga. I had an all-electric home up on a hill. And we got three feet of snow in Chattanooga. And the power went out. And the house started getting colder and colder. I only had Jacob and Jordan at the time. And they were babies. And I put them in the bed. We put every blanket we had on the bed. We all gathered in the bed. We were freezing. I came to the point where I started looking at furniture. And, and this is all seriousness. I was going to tear up some furniture to start a fire. Because I said, I've got to keep my family warm. And we're freezing to death in this house. And finally, my stepfather, bless his heart, walked through the snow. Let me tell you how bad the snow was. It was so bad that when he got to our house and he was walking, over, he fell in a snow drip. And my stepfather was 6'2". It went over his head. He said, oh, great. When this thaws out in a month, they're going to find me dead in the front yard somewhere. you know." But he somehow got through. We got out of there. I was beginning to think when I was freezing to death, but our little gas fireplace that we have, Last week, that it didn't get close to that, but makes you think, doesn't it? And the stuff goes away that quick. What if we just collapse from moral decay? I mean, for all the great this nation has done, for all the good that it stands for, for all the freedom that it has taken to nations of the world, for all of the people we have liberated from bondage with our armies, never to conquer but always to liberate, for all the missionaries we've sent, for how the gospel has gone around the world because of us, yet still we are purveyors of the most filth that the world knows through Hollywood and pornography to the nations of the world. Dinesh D'Souza wrote a book years ago and said Hollywood should take some of the blame for 9-11 because what some of them over there are saying is don't bring your filth to our country because that's all they ever see of America is what Hollywood produces or what comes across the digital airwaves in pornography. Listen, there, there's a lot of just junk. We got a politician today. I'm, I'm glad I'm running out of time because I'd, I'd really like to talk here. I mean, we got policies today that say, trust us with your health care, and they can't even tell the difference between a man and a woman and who ought to use the men's bathroom and who ought to use the women's bathroom. I got all the, all the compassion in the world for people who struggle with that. But listen, come on. We can't even decide that. We are morally bankrupt as a nation. Our leaders are hypocrites in both parties, and it is an absolute mess. There's only one thing going to save us. That's revival. Revival of God's church is all that's going to save us. You say, well, what else could happen? Natural disasters could happen. All kinds of things could happen, folks, and we could immediately go to irrelevant. We're already, today, the headline on Fox News this past week, I meant to make a picture of it, put it in my sermon. I'm just now thinking. I turned it on, the headline said, Middle Eastern leaders are worried that America is retreating from the world stage. That was the headline. They already see it. We're backing up. We're taking care of ourselves, spending money on ourselves. You know what else could happen that could wreck our nation and make it irrelevant? You ready for this? The rapture of the church. Mm. Good, I'm not saying. What happened if all believers were immediately taken out? What does the Bible teach us? We're going to get to this passage later in our series. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7 says, And now you know what's remaining, that he, talking about the Antichrist, may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains... We'll do so until he's taken out of the way. Can you imagine where the world and where this nation would go if all believers were taken out immediately? I mean, and progressives and people who, who want to wreck everything and want, you know, you know speak, by the way, excuse me, but some people have never built anything in their life, but they wreck what others have built. That happens in churches, that happens in, in the world, that happens in it happens everywhere. And, and you know what? What, what? If we were all gone and they got their way, this thing would be bankrupt and more than it already is. Final two verses, and I'm three. I'm going to make it before 12. Two verses. Second Chronicles 7, 14. You know that verse. My people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven. Now, that's a verse written to Israel, but we know it's the heart of God to all nations. Nineveh was a capital of Assyria and 
God sent a prophet Jonah there. And when Jonah finally got there after a little nudging from God and being swallowed by a great fish, he preached to them and said, God's going to destroy you if you don't repent. Well, guess what? They repented. And the Bible says since they repented, God changed his mind too. He always Repentance always changes the mind of God. And, and you know, you're, you're headed to curse and destruction. You repent, you're headed to blessing and life. I mean, it's always that door that swings the blessings of God, repentance. They repented, and we know that's God's heart, even though there's a promise to Israel. We claim it for our country. We say, you know, if revival will just come, if God's people will awaken, if we'll start praying, if, if, if righteous people get, you know, oh, you know, all that, we see all that in revival. But I'm going to give you a very sober warning today. Because there comes a time when you get to Jeremiah 7, 16. Because Jeremiah was in that same position with the people of Israel. And look what God said to Jeremiah. Therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe we're still on 2 Chronicles 7, 14 side. The heart of God, Nineveh, repentance and blessing and revival and hope and restoration. But can I just tell you that one day, if you don't stop, you get to Jeremiah 7, 16. God says there. You say, well, how would that? It's because, listen, the judgment of God is not really fireballs from heaven. The judgment of God was when God says, okay, I'll let you do what you want to do. Romans chapter 1, he gave themselves up. That's why sodomy is a sign of the judgment of God. Because God has just taken his hands off and let people do bad things. Mm. I'll get kicked off for saying what I just said today. Because you can't talk like that anymore in this world. There's got to be love and, and compassion and caring. And I'm the love and the care because I love you enough to tell you the truth. And the truth is God ain't pleased with all this sin in America. We, we need enough preachers to quit tiptoeing around the tulips and start standing up and tell the truth. And we need some others to stand up and do it as well, too, so the people will know God's going to hold us accountable. Will you give me one more minute? I had an experience this week. I, mean, I just real quickly got to tell you this. I had an experience this week where it, there's this comedian that's done a comedy special, and he evidently said some things that were very politically incorrect. And everybody was talking about it. I sit on the news. I hear other people talking about it and all that stuff. So I go and watch it. And the reason I'm not telling you about it, he's filthy. You know, but boy, did he say some things that nobody else is saying. And so then I went and listened to this, I don't know, a sportscaster who had a show. And it's a podcast, but he does video podcasts as well. And I watched it. And it, it's an African-American sportscaster. Jason Whitlock's his name. And he, has, uh, he had two guests there with him. And they, they spent the whole program talking about this, this comedy special. And Jason Whitlock, a, who is a believer, but he's a sports announcer, said something that stopped me dead in my tracks. He said, you know the problem we have in America today? And he said, I've been saying this for a long time. I said, two people have failed us in America today. And the two people that have failed us are ministers of the gospel and comedians. And I thought, What? And then he said this, he said, comedians and ministers of the gospel have a platform to tell us uncomfortable truths that we don't want to hear. And both of them are getting so woke, America is not hearing the truth. Whoa. That's like a slap of cold water on my face. You know, sometimes I'll get up here and I, you know, I, and listen, I said things when I started out ministry that were unkind to certain people who struggle with certain sins. Because that sin was so far away from me, it was easy for me just to jump on that and, you know, rah, rah, and say ugly things. Well, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not saying ugly things. I know people struggle with all manner of things. But I am going to say this. When you start seeing a cultural shift, somebody needs to stand up and say, wait a minute, just because we're loving and kind doesn't mean we don't believe that's right. And we, we won't believe that's wrong. I mean, we, we know the difference between right and wrong. The, the only hope for your life, the only hope for this nation, the only hope for this world is for somebody to be able to say, there's right and wrong, there's evil and good. And we've got to quit following under Isaiah saying, when woe unto them who call evil good and good evil, because that's exactly what happens in America today. Whether I'm guilty, you're guilty, we're all guilty, still we need to stand up and say, this is right and this is wrong. You know, Jesus never compromised what was right and wrong to still love and touch and com have compassion on people. 
It's too long I've worried in our country about the lack of civility today. We can't disagree without thinking we hate each other. I love, so I've got friends that live lifestyles that I don't approve of or don't believe in at all. But you know what? I still love them. I still have some relationship with them. And they know where I stand. I know where they come from. But you know what? They know. And that doesn't happen in America today. We've drawn so many lines today. We can't disagree and still have compassion for one another. So I'm not standing in that kind of judgmental attitude, but I am going to say this. We need to mark the line and start telling the truth of this. It's time. It's going to make you uncomfortable. It's going to make me uncomfortable. But the truth has to be told. Amen. Let's stand up. I'm out of time. Thank you for letting me cover all this material that I have here today. Probably could have been expeditious and left some of it behind, but I hope you see a little bit of what God